So I'm going to talk about uh, atomic electron tomography uh, capturing the 3D atomic structure of non-crystalline materials. Now we already heard uh, two beautiful talks by Angus Kirkland and uh, Paul Boyce on the uh, advanced electron microscopes to capture atom, uh, atom positions. And uh, Paul also shows some beautiful pictures of the 3D, actually you can get a 3D. Uh, that's you know, eventually you want to get a 4D, X, Y, Z, and a time. So I want to first, because it's a tutorial, I will give some a little background on tomography. So why tomography? So in 1991, there's a um, cartoon in the New, York, New Yorker's magazine shows a rabbit, but it projected it under like the hand. Uh, because you know, nature, we are four dimensional, X, Y, Z, and a T. Uh, if you just capture the 2D image, that's you know, sometimes you get a disguised uh, information, right? And uh, this is a very large object, but talk about atoms, so the 3D, 4D is very, very important. So I just first give a brief introduction about the tomography. So Rennig, I mentioned 1895, Rennig discovered x-rays by accident. And he got first physics Nobel prize in 1900. And they, actually, there was some debating whether the second person, there are two people, I mean, and the committee was so come, come, uh, impressed by Rennick, and so he got a Nobel Prize, he's a one person, single person Nobel Prize. And then Radon, as a mathematician, uh, 1917, it's a French mathematician developer, it's called Radon Transform. I can briefly mention my Radon Transform. And then Breswell and Radon developed an imaging reconstruction method called future back projection. I'm going to briefly mention from a mathematical perspective to invert fan beam scans in radio astronomy. You can see that the, the, uh, tomography has broad applications, okay, from across many different fields. And then Alan Kluge and Delosha uh, de demonstrated electron tomography of biological samples. Uh, Kluge uh, got a Nobel Prize in, in chemistry uh, in, I think, the 1980s or 70s. And then Hans Feld invent X-ray computer tomography scans, and uh, COMAC develop image reconstruction algorithms. Uh, actually, it's not exactly art, but it's a kind of a, a reconstruction algorithm from projection to get, a, get an image, 3D structures. Now, now they, they actually also got a Nobel Prize in, in, in medicine and uh, physiology and medicine. The Co COMAC was the high energy physicist, okay? He spent his career to study high energy physics. And his hobby, he published two papers in applied phys physics uh, letters on this uh, no 3D reconstruction. <laughs> he eventually became famous because he got a Nobel Prize from his hobby. There are two papers. So this is why it's important, you know, in, especially in science. In, in, you have to be the early, the, the first one. Zero to one is important, right? So this is kind of, let me just give it, what's the radon chance for? So you have a, a 2D ob ob object here, okay? So you have a shine, a wave, uh, X-rays, so you get a projection image. This is P theta R is a projection, right? This is just basically you have F, X, Y, correspond this function. You do line integral, line integral, this just left the line, line integral, you get the projection, right? 2D become 1D, okay? This is radon called radon, this is a radon transform, right? And then, now, now, the very important theorem called, is called Fourier slide theorem. So what is Fourier slide theorem? It says that if you have a projection image, okay, this is a 2D projection. If you take a Fourier transform of this projection, okay, 1D Fourier transform here, that's the equivalent of take a 2D Fourier transform of this object and across this line. So this, which means that the 1D Fourier transform projection at a given angle is equivalent to the value of the 2D for each of the, uh, uh, the object along the, formed, along the line formed by the same angle in reciprocal space, in the Fourier space. That's actually very simple from a mathematical perspective, right? And uh, this is actually very important for the uh, kind of, you know, the, the reconstructions. Now, one of the problems for tomography is if you look at, an, okay, when we, we only measure the you know, discrete positions, okay? It's like this blue dots. If you put many blue dots together, you'll find the density of the blue dots near the origin is higher than at a larger distance, larger than larger spatial frequency. Okay, this problem has to be fixed. Uh, now, the second problem is that for discrete data, the FFT can be, you know, the free transform can, FFT can be used. The problem is the FFT is only for the Cartesian grid, but here it's in the polar grid, right? So you have to project from polar grid to Cartesian grid. 
And so the field back position is a very popular method. It's still actually, if we go to hospital, you have a CAT scan, CD scan, it's used for field back projection. It's a still popular, yes, yeah, still field back projection. Because if your number of projections is infinitely large, it's exactly mathematically exact. So uh, let me just explain how the field of action pretty well. You have object space, object space, you get the projections at different angles, right? And then take a Fourier transform for each projection, and then you just uh, put a weighting factor. So what is the weighting factor for? The weighting factor is to compensate the, the density of these points. You want to make the density actually uniform. Okay? This is very simple from math. So you just put a, a, a filter here, and then you put it back, Okay, you get this projection, and then you simply just project back. You just smear each projection back to the, uh, in ob ob the object space, and you get a 3D, ob the, the 2D uh, reconstruction. So W uh, is multiplied, is, is Fourier variable. It's a f yeah, yeah. Precisely the Fourier variable. Yes. It's like taking a derivative of one of those. That is, uh, when you multiply a Fourier transform by W, it's uh, essentially the same as taking a gradient. For what it's worth, it doesn't matter. Okay. Okay. Is okay. Yeah. Is it good? Right. Yes. Sorry. What's the difference between the third and the fourth? Third and fourth, you, you because this is a Cartesian grid. So here, just from here to here, just you collect the the density uniformity. Okay. The density is not a uniform. So you multiply by the filter. So make the density actually uniform. It's a little space. So the image, and then you simply just project the back. You back called back projection. How does the back projection work? So you 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 just that's this, uh, this projection, you just project back a value along this line, along this, okay, you just project back, okay? You, you, you just, it's a pixel, you, like the, you, you have a, the pixel value here, right? You make it, the, the, the overlap of the pixel exactly the same along this line. But the pixels there are not lying on the grid. So how do you project back? Right, that, that's actually, uh, this is a good point. So there, there's some kind of uh, uh, interpolation. interpolation, yeah. That's a different kind of way of the interpolation. That's a little shaky. Yeah. So, the, but it is the most part. But actually, mathematical one, if you have infinite number, if the number of the projections is infinity, actually, this can be. I think that more people convert to Cartesian grid in uh, Fourier space. No, no, it's, 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 because the problem in the Fourier space is uh, the intensity variation is larger. Yeah, but. But then the interpolation is more. Right. But interpolation is more 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 difficult. Little space is better. Right. So this is a simple method, but no, it is still in the hospital, popular. At least a few years ago. Now there are some different you know, uh, iterative algorithms, but it uh, turns out iterative algorithms sometimes introduce artifacts. You know, when, you pay, when the doctor sees the patient, they don't want artifacts. Artifacts cause problems, so they have to be very, very careful. No. This, this is actually without any regularization. Yeah. Well, because you have number of projections. This is why you know, for humans, you take a lot of projections to you. So actually, it's not good for you. Uh, dose, uh, actually, CT produces the largest dose, radiation dose of any you know, uh, uh, in, the, in the world, actually, CT, CT scan. CT scan actually is the largest radiation dose. It's not a new atomic bomb, atomic no. Do, well, so far, still the field back projection is popular, yes, sir. Yeah, but that, I think that they developed some... some well, there's some method to develop, but, the yeah. But, but uh, yeah, so, so for this, actually, uh, though, because we, they don't want the, the body, they don't want like a sub-millimeter scale resolution, okay? They, they don't want the, the resolution for a doctor to see the cancers, right? They just a millimeter resolution, so it's not that... Uh, uh, yeah, so far, the field back projection you know, for most uh, CT scan, but then recently, okay, they have some more advanced algorithm developed, now in the GE there. We want to try to collaborate with them because we, we develop a good algorithm. We're going to talk about our work, uh, but they, they are very you know, uh, protective for, the, for these large companies. Yeah, and then there's also iterative algorithm development, you know, the, the art and the SART and the CERT, okay, this iterative algorithm. So iterative algorithm, you have W times F equal to PP is a projection. W is a matrix. F is also a matrix, okay? No, it's a 3D matrix, right? So you, you just, if you, now this W is determined. If you, P is, can be measured, so you want to calculate F. Now, usually inverted that 3D matrix, it's kind of a could have cost, it's very sensitive to the noise, all this. So usually it's iterative algorithms, okay, ART, CERT, SART. Make an initial guess of a solution. You, then you compute the projection based on W times this capital P, and then update the guess based on the difference between the actual projection and the computer projection. 
It's very, very simple iterative algorithms. Okay? And uh, so now, when I was at Stanford, I, in the 2004, I come to, I just drove down front. I was my family at a minivan and I drove around uh, Northern California to uh, uh, Southern California. So here, here she was. Uh, we developed so equal slope tomography. I, why equal slope tomography? Because when I was at Stanford, I asked uh, one of my associates, uh, say, I want a uh, polar facet for each other. Because FFT is from Cartesian coordinate to a Cartesian coordinate. I said, well, please find out whether there's a polar facet for each other. Then we solve the problem. We can use iterative algorithm. And he did some uh, search and found it. He said, mathematician actually showed there cannot be exact polar facet for each other. Actually, this has been showed. If it, there's a mathematical book. But some mathematician, actually, Dave Donahoe, some, some of you probably know. And a collaborator developed so called pseudo polar facet for each other. So, what is pseudo polar facet? So, we developed equal slope tomography. I'm going to buy my pseudo polar So, what you mean is instead of that angle is incremental, that slope is incremental. And there's actually more elegant mathematical way to directly to invert. Okay? So, so what is a pseudo pass for? So, okay, so what we did is I'm going to explain. We first measure the images, okay, at the equal slope increment. And then we use a fractional Fourier transform. Some of you probably heard about a fractional Fourier transform. Fourier transform is the first FFT is if the integral, the, the, the neighboring distance of the two pixels is A, then the free space is 1 over A, okay? But a fractional Fourier transform actually, you be not a 1 over A, it can be a fractional 1 over A. So, you, this, the reason is a fractional because at a different angle, you, you can see this distance, this, this distance, this, this is equal. But this distance, this distance is not equal. So, you need a fractional Fourier transform to this. And then we use the iterative algorithm. So the iterative process I used from CDI, I saw the phase problem applied here. Here's a, a pseudo polar fast Fourier transform. And from the pseudo polar fast from the Cartesian grid to pseudo polar grid, the pseudo polar grid is like this. It's just concentric, uh, concentric squares. Actually, uh, Donahoe and others, they actually show the part. <laughs> they can exactly from Cartesian grid to polar, pseudo polar grid, this, Almost exact, just like uh, not exactly orthogonal, but uh, they can almost uh, they can make the the error is very very small. Now we can, uh, and then with uh, PPFFT do inverse, and then do the uh, with the objective we put some constraint. And we, can, we can say regularization, or we sometimes we we use, sometimes we don't, depend on the you no know, the, the the object the TV, and then the PPFT. So this actually turns out to work very well. So we actually. Uh, did this uh, first simulation? We did even some collaborate with some um, the UCI hospital. Did some experiment on on a patient, and here just you know after 45, 45 iterations, he get very good results. Uh, so you, know, you can show actually at the beginning it's very noisy, and after you know it's very very noisy. Just uh, and after forty five iterations, so you can see this. Uh, you know, feedback projection because the number when the number of projection is limited, then feedback projection is a problem. A lot of artifacts. But this one, yes, Tino. We actually <laughs> let's collaborate with the Stan and with the, uh, Mao, Dave Mao, was, uh, many years ago. That's the first to start collaborating with Stan's group. Um, I'd like to say that TV helped a lot here. The TV helped a lot, but, uh, but EST, even in some cases, we don't even, even be, because this algorithm, we even use some general constraints, like a positivity constraints, right? The positivity constraints, all this can help, always better than feedback projection. You can think feedback projection for the iteration. Just, just go back. And if you iterate, you always can do better. The TV definitely helps this. OK, that, that's kind of the history. And it's, uh, my group continue to, uh, I actually continue to collaborate with uh, Stan's group and uh, with, you know, postdoc, they continue working with us. And uh, I'm going to also show kind of, I think, a future direction for medical uh, CT scan. That's use, instead of this absorption, use a phase contract. So if I go to hospital, OK, get a CT scan, it's based on absorption coefficient. So when, which means the bone has a larger absorption. Softer tissue is small absorption. OK, cancer, because the density, a lot of cells, this absorption is a, a little larger than the uh, normal tissue. So this is different. But for x-rays, now there's a complex refra index refraction, or index refraction, OK? You know, the index refraction, you know, what is 1.3, glass 1.5. But this has become complex x-rays. And delta, this index refraction is a little smaller than one, delta and a beta. This corresponds phase shift because x-ray is still wave, phase shift. This one called absorption. 
So usually, when you go to the hospital, any scan, okay, mammography, any scan, that's the measure this time, beta. But the delta uh, is, 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 turns out to be much more uh, you know, useful than for, for imaging. Now, if you do this, this beta is related to the mu, the absorption coefficient, okay? This, but uh, no, actually also wave propagates, so the phase shift is related to delta. Now, between five, 15, 25 KEVs, okay? So some is, sometimes hospital even, even higher, 60 KEVs, but even higher is the ratio even larger. Delta over beta is about 100 to 1,000. So in principle, if you can use the phase contrast, you can reduce those by 100 to 1,000. This is one example, actually. But how to do phase contrast? So this actually go back to the famous experiment in 1887 by Michelson and Molay. This is called the most, failed, most famous failed experiment. So what did they try to do? They tried to measure ether. Now, in 1860, Maxwell this, you know, developed this Maxwell equation and it showed light is uh, a wave, okay? The light is a wave, but then if a wave, you know, based on the, at that time, people understand wave, and you have to have the media, okay? Ocean wave, sun wave, whatever wave. You have to have a media to propagate a wave. So, and, so then physicists propose that it must be ether in the space. Then light can propagate. So they try to measure it, ether, experiment demonstrate. So what they did is they, they have a laser. At, at that time, even no laser, but it's just a coherent wave. Have a mirror, this fixed mirror, this move. This, this, this refracted come back, this some part of refracted, so they have interference. This interference is so important because this can get sub angstrom much smaller than angstrom precision. Okay? Now there's a LIGO. LIGO is based on this. They measure the gravitational wave because this is longer, longer, which is more accurate. So they actually measured, they, 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 yes? When you say sub angstrom you intend to say that when you use x-rays or? No, no, use visible, visible light. light. Yeah. Visible light, visible light, sub angstrom visible light. In many sub angstrom hundreds of the, the wave, no, one hundredth of wavelengths, some kinds. This, and they actually did an experiment very little. They, they, they did it under the mountain, the beneath the mountain of the tunnel. And they have a mercury um, uh, bath. And in the, on the mercury bath, they built a boat with a granite. Okay? They put an instrument on the granite. And then they measured twice a year, because the Earth is, is circulating around the sun. So they measured twice a year a different. So, because ether, let's say stationary, if the Earth is moving, so at, yeah, one, one time a year, you exactly you know the, the, the Earth's the motion, and the, you have a wind, ether wind, the opposite direction, okay, twice a year. So they find, they claim, if, if the ether existing, then the speed of light should be different. Okay, based on the, this, actually, the, the distance is very, very accurate. The time is, can be controlled. But they find the speed of light always is C. So they were very disappointed. <laughs> it's just the most famous failed experiment. Why is the most famous? <laughs> My cousin got a Nobel Prize in 1907, the first American got a Nobel Prize in science. And, uh, and it then prompted Einstein to develop relativity, the so special relativity because of this experiment. Why it's important? Because they always measure, no matter what, the speed of light is C. It cannot be faster than C. So this is such an experiment. And it's later, you know, the application for the, uh, uh, this LIGO, right? And also be used for, for medicine. That's amazing. That's just, uh, so the actual phase contrast is similar. Actually, you see the you know, inflammation, they split it. And I get a sample here, I get an interference. There's different kind of geometry, okay? Basically, same thing, the face. So the face is important. Again, the face is important. LIGO also measured the face. This measured the face, and the face contrast, the face. So here I can show you one example. This is actually absorption of a breast cancer, actually a breast I just can't, cancer here. This is a face contrast. Same, and you can see the, in this case, it's much less dose. I'm going to show some specific. We actually did some work, a uh, published paper on this. And um, so we did an experiment years after Grenoble. Okay, Grenoble was uh, the place when uh, Fourier was once the governor of the Grenoble. This was this uh, facility of the Joseph Fourier University, also at Grenoble. So we, we did this actually uh, the face contrast experiment on the breast cancer sample with nine centimeters in diameter. And, um, and then we did a you know, comparison between field back projection with 2,000 projections versus, yes, actually with 512. 
And this is actually cancer. So our, actually our collaborator told us, I, I cannot tell the difference. And uh, this 512 actually almost even you know, better. We, later we have a quantitative. Uh, and then we you know, feel back to 512 become noisy. And ESD 200 and also become noisy. So, we, we, um, so here it shows the reconstruction with the 512 projections. And a different angle, you can see that this one is called uh, collagen strands. The two is uh, glandular tissue and uh, speculations. Based on my understanding, spe spe uh, spe speculations, that's corresponds to you know, the boundary of the breast cancer. Okay, this is a breast cancer, right? And then we did you know, did very rigorous. We collaborated with a, a group in Germany, uh, and uh, they did the evaluation. We, we, we mixed the, all the, the images all together. We sent the doctors, the, the doctor, medical doctors, the images, asked them to evaluate. Okay, we send a full set of images, complete blind evaluation. One is the field back portion 2000. This EST is only 512, so 74 dose reduction, and this field back projection 512, and EST only uh, no, 200 iterations. And there's the different quality, overall image quality, sharpness, image contrast, evaluation, different structures, noise level. And you can see this one is always, almost, always better. The, one is the best, and uh, five is the best, and one is the worst. <laughs> That's quite interesting. And, uh, and here it shows, actually, then we do second mutation. This is actually the cancer here. Okay, and so the total dose, in our case, is only 1.96 milligram. But uh, for the dual view, you know, women at a certain age, they have to do mammography, okay? The mammography usually uh, for the two views, dual views, it's about 3.4 milligram. So this one is even lower, it can get 3D. Now you may ask, why not it become popular? You know, if you become popular, I could be rich, right? Uh, this is, every hospital <laughs> can be applied. The problem is that you need a coherent X-ray source. The X-ray, right now, the, all the machines actually generated incoherent. You cannot have this phase control. Phase, phase control, you need a coherent X-ray source. So this actual company is developing this. If we can have a coherent X-ray source, this will be a revolution of medical imaging, period because you get effect of 100,000 and it was with you know, iterative algorithms, okay? So th 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 that's a kind of a little background on this, not a, because my goal is actually for this work, for this talk is focus on atoms. Uh, but it turns out, you know, atom cancer you know, is related, is similar. From a mathematical algorithm point of view, there's no difference, right? So we develop algorithms, so we continue to improve. EST, and that's a 2000, many years ago, 2005, and in 2017, we developed a gen for generalized for iterative reconstruction algorithms. I already mentioned about the, uh, in my previous talk. So we borrow some ideas from CDI, so iterative algorithms, and we can do better than, or much better than others. And lately, we collaborated with Stan Ocean and uh, Min, actually, Mary Min, we could desire uh, Leo space iterative. I can be even slightly better than Gen5. So we continue to improve the reconstruction algorithms. So why is this, so I'm the main of them mainly focus on atoms. Okay. So why atoms? 3D atoms is so important. Well, as I mentioned, the first like, experimental atomic structure was table salt and the diamond. Because atom even is a history. You know, his philosopher more than 2,500 years ago, they were thinking, what are they made of? Right, atom. Adam actually is a, uh, the Greek, uh, the Latin, A means uncuttable. A is not. Tom is a cuttable, uncuttable. So this, 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 at some point, you, know, you cannot cut, 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 cut. At some point, it should be not cuttable, right? So philosophy is very interesting. This is a reduction theory. If you can keep cutting, cutting, it becomes zero, nothing. You cannot have nothing to make something. So at some point, it has to be uncuttable. So called Adam. That's Adam from. Atoms are always, the from a philosophical point is very, very important. This is actually the first three atomic structures. And this is the first the protein structures as a protein data bank. Okay? This has become actually, so for 3D atomic structures determine the physical properties of protein functions. A picture is worth a thousand words. That's the same, right? But in my opinion, 3D atomic model is worth a thousand pictures. So the reason is the atomic model become immortal. The data is there like a protein data bank. The protein data bank recently played a very important role for the alpha fold. The particular protein structures, machine, machine learning, you have to learn. Where to learn? You have to the atomic core, you can learn. I mean, they cannot uh, know. The, so, so, so far, the protein actually is very successful. They learn because of the protein data bank. They have to learn from something. And that, that's, that's kind of, so this data we have to produce, the good quality data. 
And uh, so the perfect crystal has been solved, but the perfect crystal rare, as you know, Paul Voice mentioned, real materials often contain crystal defects, surface reconstruction disorder. These are very important. And uh, how to understand those atomic structures in 2D, 3D, and 4D. That's uh, actually, you know, it's a really a grand challenge for, 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 for many years in, in physical sciences. So we developed, you now we with atomic electron tomography. I just you know, for many years I worked on a medical image. I thought, no, that's fine. We, we had a company, actually, we had a company, actually, a venture capital, they invested um, over a million dollars working with us. And Ben Fahimi was one of my students, and now he's a professor at Stanford. He's very you know, energetic. I said, Ben, you, you, you have, I don't have time for, the, for this crap. And he, but he, he's very energetic, he, he worked on this. But after a while, and I feel, you know, this is fine, but we can also solve fundamental important problems. So I applied some of the methods that we developed for medical <laughs> to see individual atoms in 3D. That actually really made a fundamental uh, Im impact uh, to physical science. So we measured it use state of our electron microscopes, okay, now as, as Paul and Angus mentioned, Paul voice, and get the images, you scan transmission electron microscope, or lately we use you know, tachography is a CDI method to get even you know, low dose. And then we use the iterative algorithm, okay, to get the, the best possible uh, structures. So this is actually, that's a very interesting view. When you do measurement, any measurement, it's always incomplete and noisy information. Why right? all human, everything, we're made of quarks. <laughs> and we cannot see quarks in your body, even the best mind. It's always approximation. When you do any measurement, you take a picture, whatever, it's always an incomplete measurement. So the question is, one from this incomplete measurement, we try to get the best possible reconstruction. You cannot, there's no such thing can get a perfect reconstruction. The quark in my body, no, nobody can see it, right? So what can see, the molecule cannot see it. So there's always kind of an approximation. So our method just try to find the best possible solution, not a perfect solution. Best possible solution that are consistent with the measurement and consistent with general constraints. The constraints are like it should be positive, positivity. Okay? And uh, we try to be as general as possible. No? Positive, there should be a boundary, like a support or, right? So this is kind of a very general constraint. Actually, is that, so are you fast enough at that? that you can then modify the data you record in order to... Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we, we, I mean, iterative, yeah, we, we, this is a good point. We are, we've been using GPU, actually, iterative algorithm very, very fast nowadays. And we are also actually, this, no, this is another possible, we've been working on using, you know, uh, deep learning can be actually instantaneously, you no, know, to get this. So this is actually, uh, it's a fast, um, uh, but with the deep learning help, I think it can be you know, almost instantaneously. Uh, th that's actually another future direction. I mean, you can, how to get in with the measurement is deep learning help us to do 3D reconstruction, even 4D. 4D means you know, we want to add a function of time, space and time, right? And uh, so this is actually first when I you know, started working on this project, so no funding. So I went to the dean, uh, at that time the Joe Rudnick, I said, Joe, no, I need your help to give me some money to, to start the project. So usually when you start initial work on an important project, they usually you know, it's, uh, uh, nobody wants to fund you because it's the highest kind of work. Usually the important project is the highest kind of work. Funding agencies, they don't want to take risks. Okay, that's the way it is because funding, they want to have a, you know, a guarantee you get the results, right? Published papers, those kind of, so I, so now, we use microscope at the CNS, and that Paul was a CNS director, Paul Weiss. The, the microscope, $150 an hour during week time, weekdays, and uh, no, very cheap, it's like $70, you know, I forgot, $70, $60 in the weekend. I, so I told I, my student, Mary Scott, you know, she's a professor at Berkeley, just recently got a tenure. I said, Mary, let's do it. I also learned, you know, she and I were with other Matt Mac, Mecklenburg, I said, no, let's do a weekend, okay? I buy you lunch, free lunch, but it saves me a lot of money. Because when we do that, they had a 10 hour street. So that will be 70, no, 70, 150, that's, that's over $1,000, $1,500 a day. And that's just, I didn't have a funding for this. That's just impossible. So I bought them free lunch. I, I told Mary and the CC chair was two students. They were, 
the, the, one of the constraints one, I said, okay, you work on this project, highly highly work. If it's successful, both, I can guarantee both will become professors. If not, I can still guarantee you both get a PhD, you will have to go to industry. I asked her, do you want to do it? She said, yes. <laughs> so we first work on the uh, 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 no, uh, golden nanoparticles. And this is the first time we can see actually, a, a thi we can slice through a 3.36 inch from a thick central slice. You can see them atoms, individual atoms. Only <laughs> for the first time, we can see 3D. Okay? And then we, and this actually this golden nanoparticle is um, icosahedron, icosahedron uh, symmetry. Icosahedron is the highest order. Now, I think Paul Voice also mentioned in, uh, in metallic glasses, icosahedron, because it's the high, highest symmetry. This is actually good now, you can see it's indeed a gold, right? <laughs> this is gold. And, um, uh, this is two photosymmetries, three photosymmetries. It's isosurface random. And you can see some, uh, the resolution is 2.4 angstroms. And we, claim. and we can see some interesting detail. Now, this is actually the experimental measurement. This is our reconstruction, so it's very consistent. The, the advantage is we can always compare uh, you know, uh, this, this uh, projection with the, the reconstruction, make it consistent. And this is called you know, five fold symmetries. This is called twin boundary. Twin boundary means this is just like a mirror. The atom here and here, just like a mirror. Okay, that's sub twin boundary, grand boundary here, right? And what do we find very interesting? Now, if we go slice by slice, now people thought that the, the twin boundary should be a plane. That's the lowest energy. Okay, if you think about the planes, it's not the same plane. There's high energy. But a fivefold is fivefold is nature doesn't like a fivefold. Why? Because fivefold you cannot fill the space. This is crystal has no fivefold. Quasi crystal fivefold. Right? Fivefold is bad for crystal. For for filling space, fivefold is not good. So these have high strength, and we find that you know, this is actually a slice. You can see this actually, this kind of, a, this is not a plane. The line actually is changing. So this is three consecutive plane, top, middle, bottom, atomic layer time. You can see this one actually shifted. You can hear the mirror. Here's a mirror, right? So it's not along this line anymore. So this is kind of a steps, atomic steps at the two boundaries. How come the boundaries are straight lines, so the core section? I mean, so the boundary is the, the straight line. That that's well. It, it has to be. That's mean energy minimized. It should be lowest energy. Yeah, but but no. The, that's the people textbook said it should be lowest energy. It should be the yeah mean and we we in, this one's our experiment data. We didn't minimize. We didn't do any minimization. But that's what we saw. So nature said not is always lowest state, lowest energy state. Well, well this this is not a. Zero Kelvin, this is not, we room temperature. Most of the materials, <laughs> you know, we want a room temperature or much above the zero Kelvin. So, yeah? We, we didn't minimize, this is just our reconstruction. So, so nature minimizing, well, I, I think the nature is, I feel that this always you knows the state like in our human body. It's, it's not a global minimization, it's a, it's a matter stable state. Yeah. The trapped local minimum, it's a matter stable state. It's, it's a local minimum. I mean, if a global minimum, you know, the world will be much smooth, right? There will be probably no Trump, probably. <laughs> I mean, the global minimization. I mean, everybody will be, you know, similar to low energy state, you know, happy, right? <laughs> what about those angles? Is there anything special about those? I mean, the, 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 what angle? This, yeah, when they all come together, your angles, you know, uh, in, in optimization of many canonical sorts, you get triple point, 120 degrees, uh -huh. something like that. Uh -huh. Does anything like that pop up over here? No. Yeah, this angle, there's actually, because of five-fold symmetry, in the 3D, you know, there's an angle, the actually exactly, cannot, as I mentioned, cannot exactly feel the space. So there's some, actually, the angle, there's some, actually, uh, distortion. At the angle, there's a distortion. Yeah, this actually five fold is very interesting. I mean, uh, Paul probably uh, Paul voice I know. I mean, five fold has been material science has been for because it's nature doesn't forbid it. And this is twin. This is twin boundaries, right? And uh, the quasi crystal defined. It's not a twin. The, the quasi crystal the exactly kind of five fold symmetry. So, but for the twin, the angle actually there's some distortion. They actually, yeah. When we look at into the, if we, you look at our paper in the detail, we have a discussion about the you know, angles, there's um, some distortions. Okay, then we also, the, the most important for this, yes? 
Uh, yeah, I have a question about these defects. So we've seen these uh, images where the defects kept appearing and disappearing and changing all the time. What tells you that these line defects are not changing over time? Well, so yeah, it depends on, depend on different materials. Like a gold is very solid. I mean, you have to control the dose. The, the, the dose, uh, oh, yes. it, yeah, nothing happened. For gold, is, no, gold is valid. For two D materials, yes. Light element on surface, yes. I mean, we actually did an experiment. Later, I'm going to show an experiment. With the two samples, we 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 take a sequential data set. Okay, take one data set and take another data set, and we do independently construction. We compare, and they're consistent. But of course, you have to. We have to make sure that those the, the samples are not damaged. So. And the important thing is you know, dislocations. And dislocations are important. Historic is important. Why? You know, this is my wedding ring, okay? 14 karat gold. Why is 14 karat gold is harder than 18 karat gold? Anybody knows why? Because of the dislocations. Our ancestors didn't know making dislocations. You know, metal dislocation can be harder. So can, if it's a perfect metal, perfect crystal, it's a soft. Like gold was high, 99.9% .9 of gold is very soft. And this gold is hard. Standard steel, you, in, you add some different carbon, some materials to make it, you know, this, this, so dislocation is important. Dislocation, what is dislocation? So this is actually FCC structure, the atoms align. This is actually 2.6 angstrom atomic layer. Align, align, but here is a stop, you see? This one line, align here. Align, this is a stop. This is called edge dislocation. Okay, this is in the text. Nobody has seen it before in the 3D, actually, uh, the, the core of the edges uh, until this, uh, especially for a screw dislocation. Screw dislocation, two atomic layer rotated by small angle. And, um, you know, but small angle is actually, because the projection image is very difficult to see, but here we actually indeed see this zigzag pattern in the textbook. Right? And also, Nature made of, <laughs> we have more than 22 million views. Most of the have you ever, seen ever made by nature. Seeing as everything's made of them, you have. But have you ever seen one on its own? Over time, microscopes have become more and more powerful, allowing us to see deeper into the world of the ultra-small. Traditional light microscopes can be used to see things like these onion cells and the structures within them as they divide, pulling apart their chromosomes. But scientists have come up with a whole host of clever methods to observe far smaller things. Using beams of electrons instead of light, we can generate detailed images of chromosomes themselves. Recently, groups of scientists around the world are becoming able to see materials at the most fundamental scale, the atomic. That's a mistake. He made a mistake. One group from the University of California in Los Angeles have been getting up close and personal with nanoparticles of platinum, just a few nanometers across. Each of the tiny dots you can see here are actually individual platinum atoms. But researchers didn't stop at a two-dimensional picture. By imaging over a hundred slices of the nanoparticle at different angles, then removing the noise with a special filter, they were able to map the location of almost every atom. The information was used to create a three-dimensional reconstruction of the whole particle in unprecedented detail. It may look blurry, but this particle is estimated to contain over 27,000 atoms. And so, like flies in a swarm, they appear to merge together. Every so often, though, we see the platinum's atomic structure align, granting us a moment of clarity. This technique is being used to analyze tiny irregularities in the structure of the particle called dislocations. Dislocations are subtle, like the misalignment of the green and red layers of atoms in this particle. But nonetheless, they can significantly change the properties of materials, with effects ranging from a change in the efficiency of LEDs to the strength of metal alloys. Three-dimensional atomic scale imaging like this is bettering our understanding of the structure of materials on this truly fundamental scale. Okay, so after we get solved that, I think it's great. And both the students actually got faculty positions, as I promised. And, and then we will continue to push you know, further. So how to push further? We've seen atoms. But I said, no, seeing is not good enough. We want to make it you know, be quantitative. Locate the position of individual atoms. That's the hard. You know? We've got individual atoms without averaging. Think about it, right? That's, you know, uh, Proton crystallography, cryom, they can do. They have to average many, many identical copies. But here, without identical identical copies, 
So we first try you know, uh, a, a tungsten needle. The reason tungsten is because it's high, high Z and it's robust. And here, different color corresponds to the, the, that uh, we, we just choose the tip part. Okay? And uh, we actually identify the individual atoms. We, we can measure the, you know, the deviation from perfect crystal. This is um, body center cube, BCC lattice. And the, the deviation is uh, within plus or minus 80 um, picometer. You know, that's actually quite small. And uh, along the Z is less than uh, minus 40 to plus 40 picometer. And we also find the point defect. There's no atom. This is densely really constructed. And then we just isosurface the rendering of the atoms. There's actually there's, there's point defect here. And then we now we compare the perfect BCC with our structure. The color corresponds to the position we determined. Remember, we, when we do reconstruction, we didn't make an assumption of the crystallinity. So the, all the trace is based on the expanded. And there's a you no know, deviation. You can see this x x direction stretched and compressing along the vertical direction. And we, we did a, no, uh, the full strand tensor. This is a displacement. You can see positive corresponds positive is going this direction, blue this direction. So x direction stretched and the vertical direction actually compressed. So we can map out all the strand tensor of the samples. And then now we try to move one step further. We want to see some you know, disorder. And uh, Paul you know, voice mentioned about disorder. Um, glass, metallic glass, this kind of, right? So we, we, we do one step with the chemical disorder. Okay, this chemical disorder. We work on the material called uh, iron platinum. So iron, iron platinum, when synthesized, they form this called disordered FCC structures, chemical disorder. You don't know which atoms are which, which mine. So chemical disorder, structurally ordered, okay? But if I knew it, it's from this called ordered FCT, FCT, so L1 zero phase. It's been layered structures. It's iron, platinum, iron. And here, when the ratio is three, this form this alternate iron platinum atom, and then platinum iron alternate. This is called L1 two phase. Now, L1 zero phase uh, for the iron platinum is uh, extremely important for a lot of applications. Yes, so for example, the uh, this is a promising candidate for next generation magnetic storage media. Okay, this is magnetic materials. And here, actually, the reconstruction. You can see we go to slice by slice. It just slices about one atomic layer thick along the node. 2.5 and you can see there are different blob, two types. One blob is called a large density, and one smaller. The platinum is a large blob, iron is a smaller blob. So from this each blob, we can identify individual atoms. Okay, we, we use some method. I, I hope in the future, you know, maybe machine learning can do better than than just our algorithms. I right? identify individual atoms, and then we can identify all the atoms, truly quantitative, on different grain boundaries, and we find one surface area. There's some large displacement. Now I'm gonna give you a quiz here. Anybody know why this surface areas actually have large displacement? And it puzzled us you know, a few days, eventually we figured out. Anybody wanna make a guess? Why is this <laughs> just on this side? There's large displacement. Then there's about 60 picometer. Okay? The point is six angstrom, it's small. And 60 picometer is almost the, 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 the radius, a little larger than the residual like tensile compressive like effect from the manufacturing it's close uh, no it's, it's very close so we put a uh, nanoparticle on the silicon nitrile membrane a very flat silicon membrane so then put uh, this this five nanometer thick silicon nitrile membrane. and then we put holes in electron microscope so it turns out this side exactly corresponds to uh, attach the surface so the interaction between the atom and the surface can be detected with our precision I'm quite accurate right this is actually um, so we, we later we double check indeed this side correspond, and we identify there are no uh, nine grain, different grains, the two large, uh, just chemical you know chemically disordered, and inside center is a one phase just disordered you no know, phase, and this l one to l one zero phase, and this, this so uh, we can get all quantitative information. And this is actually a, a, a movie. So this all, you know, this actually some side is, you now we can see perfect. This are without an assumption of crystallinity. I mean, some, I, I, if you go back, you can see actually some regions still at, because of the missing wedge. So we have the, the missing wedge still have an effect. You can see it, okay? You see, this side is not, <laughs> this side is missing wedge there. We found on the surface there's still fact. Missing wedge means you, you cannot choose the sample from plus or minus 90 degrees. Okay, you're plus or minus 70 degrees. Yes? So, uh, what 
Who's the missing wedge? So, so missing wedge, if you put it, if you rotate this sample, right, you put it in. You know, I know what the... So, pr about plus minus 20 degrees. Plus minus 20, yeah. how many projections total? With projections, we have some sample for this one close to 100. 100, 100 between plus minus 70 degrees. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we can truly, you know, identify this, and we can look at, you know, different you know, kind of the chemical order. Inside the grain, grain means you no, know, it's got a crystal inside, it should same crystal, but different grain means different orientations. Okay, we find inside the center of the grain the high order prime, order short range order prime is very good. Why means perfect. Okay, at the grain boundary there's you no know, low short range crystallinity, and this L one zero is important for technology. is important. Okay, this and the and the core has a. Platinum rich core. So that's for nanoparticle that's very well synthesized, the platinum in this core and then diffuse out. So this actually we observed and uh, consistently for all the samples like this. And we also look at it truly no individual atomic level. No? This is the, the, the density, the bottom color corresponds to our Lee Council density. And from the density we identify atoms. The, 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 our technique is a proportional kind of z to the power, you know, around the z to power 1.5, some you know, group said 1.8. So the higher the z, atomic number, the larger the, the blob. And you can see this platinum is blue, right? The iron is red, it's a small blob. So you can, and here, you know, there's a green, this the anti-phase boundaries, because this one, this one, this one, feel from L1 to phase. And this side, this one, L1. But there's a point defect. This one, if it's a perfect L1 to phase, this one should be a blue dot, but it is actually a red. So we can identify individual point defects, and here, no, indeed, this one. If it's if it blue, then the perfect L1 to face, but this one's red. And this one also, no, if red, then it's perfect, right? And there's also swap defects. So we can all kind of the different type of defects. And then we did a step further, we, because we all coordinates and the precision is quite high. This work is about 20 picometers, about 20 something picometers. So 0.2 and so on. And we can directly use as density function theory to calculate the spin and orbital atomic magnetic moments. And this is atomic coordinates and we can calculate you know, spin orbital magnetic moments. It's a DFT to calculate it. And then uh, we call it a chemical order and with the magnetic properties. This is uh, a uh, sort of local magnetic and energy, energy. Okay? Just shows L1 zero phase. The red corresponds to high, good short range order for so L1 zero phase. And this, uh, this is actually a prime order parameter. And this is called a magnetic and energy, energy calculated from DFT. So the red, this should be correlated. And then we find indeed very good, much correlated. Okay? And, and then we try to do the 40, as I mentioned, the 40. We want to see the atom actual motion, captured atomic motion in, in 40. That's really hard. And uh, so we watch how to do nucleation. Nucleation play a critical role in many physical and biological phenomena, ranging from crystallization and melting to the formation of clouds and you know, talking about global warming. And the initiation of neurodegenerative diseases. And people want to get all their Parkinson's because people believe this is from amyloid, uh, this crystallization of the the protein, they form some amyloid in, in the brain. Okay, that's also related to nucleation. Nucleation have first order phase transition starts, but it's very difficult to study because it, it, it just start to form a new phase, right? So we first did control experiment, actually related to the question earlier. Same samples, we do the con sequential experiment. Get a two, <laughs> and independently construction, so you can see the core same. Surface atom, there's some difference, okay? Overall, it can change. There's some different, but in, inside the slice, again, all the atoms, no, consist. we found more than 95% atoms are consistent with 3D precision, about 26 picometers. Okay, one picometer, 10 to minus 12 me, uh, meters. And then we do the, you know, one of my former postdocs, now he's an uh, assistant professor in the Peking University. He, he did a really heroic experiment. So he put the samples on the silicon nitrile membranes, put it in the electron microscope, they took a data set after annealing, after annealing Nine minutes, 500 kV. And then he took it out, the microscope in the air, and anew another seven minutes, and put it back to find it again. Now this is, this size in one nanometer, this is about seven to eight nanometers. You find the same atom in the, the, the grid of the, a few nanometers, a few millimeters, okay? There's many atoms, many nanoparticles. 
And he find again now after I knew it. I mean, this is just you no. Know, this is saying you know it's difficult to find a needle in a haystack. It's even more difficult than that. And we want to find the same atoms. We find the same atom because we look at the atom inside the same. But on the surface, they form this nucleation. Okay, and then did again. He did that a few times and uh, uh, three times. And uh, so we use all the parameters to find the, the nucleation. What we find is. Uh, very interesting. So all the nucleation starts on the surface. This is called heterogeneous nucleation. This is actually true. I mean, you have experience. If you put a glass of water in, in the freezer, now if you check you know, every hour and check the, the ice forming, ice first form on the surface. If, 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 if this is called heterogeneous nucleation. The other one, homogeneous nucleation. If there's no surface, homogeneous nucleation, it takes 50 years to get ice in the, in the freezer in the water. That's actually, that's the calculations, the simulations show. So all this is actually on the surface on this. And what, but we found something very interesting. Now the, there's a model called a classical nuclear theory. It's in the textbook. So what does a classical nuclear theory say? I, I get, maybe just first go back to this classical. Uh, I, I just want. So classical nuclear theory is this very simple equation, okay? That is just energy, it's a free energy change. The homogeneous, heterogeneous, just multiplied by five, the same. So when you form ice from water, you have uh, two phases. One's water, the other one's ice, right? So which means, you no, know, there's a volume energy. When you can form ice, ice should have low energy than, than water, and than liquid, right? So this kind of volume energy is surface energy. So the surface energy is always positive, volume energy is negative, and you take a derivative, so you find this, you no know, radius, okay? This is called the R star. The critical radius. So the classical nuclear theory is you just oscillates. You no, know, when when I when I put a glass of water in ice, then they form ice. These crystal, small crystals. Only if the crystal is larger than this R star, then become stable and they become larger. So they always can kind of oscillate like this. that's the classical nuclear theory, right? And, but what do we find? So classical nuclear theory always you no know, form small crystal, uniform crystal. What do we find? It's not like this. There's always have a a core, each nuclei, each nuclei will have one to few atoms, a few atoms. And it, now in this case, like a, this is what we call a glowing nuclei. The core I can get larger. The, the core, the the the, the, uh, the short range order actually. Uh, the, 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 the one means perfect. Okay, the, this uh, one is perfect. Zero is no, completely. You can see the liquid. Uh, it's a complete disorder. And this is a chemical shot, it's not a part of liquid. So this is getting larger, and this one actually, the fracture is larger, smaller, getting larger. It's two actually merge into one, it's three merge into one, and then divided, and this one dissolved. And we see all kinds of dynamics. And we, then we did a you know, gradient. We found there's always a gradient, there's always a core that goes to this here, and there's a gradient along 110 direction, 111, and then radio average. So if we take a derivative, we can see always arrow points from the core to the boundary. So we find that these three observations are actually not consistent with the classical nuclear theory. First of all, each nuclear has a core of one to few atoms with a maximum order parameter, and the, the order parameter gradient points from the core to the boundary of the nucleus. The nuclei undergo close fluctuation, dis dissolution, merging, and division, which are regulated by order parameters gradient. Early stage nuclei are un unisotropic. So that's actually, so it's not a consistent with classical, as I mentioned, classical nuclear theory. And there's also two-step nucleation model. I mean, nucleation is an important phenomenon, as I mentioned, right? There's a lot of studies. The two-step is like this. Okay, you have a you know, disordered, and somehow the classical nucleation is like this. You just oscillate. And if larger than are critical, then becomes stable and crystal. The two-step model is you have some clusters, disordered clusters. From how this cluster goes to years, and nobody knows. Just like a phenomenological uh, model. Okay, you just have an intermediate state. But what do we find? It's, we propose, based on our experimental observation, we, we propose a new model. We got an auto-parameter gradient model. So we modify the equation delta g multiplied by integral alpha as the order parameter, integral of this, and we multiply by this term. Okay, so this is kind of modified the classical nuclear theory. Remember, classical nuclear theory is like it's here. Okay, the gamma is is surface interfacial tensions, four pi r squared gamma, just surface a sphere, right? But here we, we, we did take a, uh, no, this is actually stand like it because with the absolute value. Oh, 
This, this kind of a total, they're, they're very tough. So we derive this term actually, use the actual following. So let's say we look at a small box inside of this, the nuclei, okay? So this is delta S surface, this, this delta D, right? So delta alpha over, over delta D. So we, we know it when the gamma is from zero to one, this is the surface tension is the gamma, gamma. Okay, that's definitely from gamma, surface tension. But here, this, it's a delta alpha, it's a delta alpha. It's a delta alpha is not equal to one. It's a small fraction of one. So fraction of one divided by, if one over delta D should be gamma, but here's a fraction of one, then it should be delta alpha multiplied by gamma. This is clear, right? Because if the one, then it should be gamma. But we have a delta alpha smaller than one, so delta alpha. Right? Because this, we, we calculate energy, this is absolute values. Okay, so where is R in this map? Forgive me. What, what is R? One more time. Okay. The, the, the R is the distance by the, the center. You can divide center to this point. That's R. So, so the, it's like a so, radius or something. That's a radius. It's a boot. Yes. Yeah. So you precisely. It's a boot. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's a vector, yeah. It's pointing in a direction. Yeah. So, so, so then you add all these small voxels, okay, uh, all small voxels, you sub to here, then you get exactly this term. Right? So this is, we call it effective surface areas. This term expresses. So you can see the, now, um, so, so you can see this, energy, this kind of corresponds to the uh, volume energy, surface energy. The volume energy, if, if this alpha, now I can give two examples, okay, this is mathematically. So the classical nuclear thing is like this inside because if we if we use this equation alpha i is a step function one when r prime smaller than r zero r prime larger than it is like a step function if substitute this equation here and this exactly corresponds to the classical nuclear theory right because the one integral because the surface of a sphere and this one you will take a you know, derivative become a delta function integral delta function four pi r squared gamma. So classical nucleus energy is like so. But we found that there's a gradient, remember the gradient. The core, the, nucle the, uh, the, 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 the gradient, there's a core and it slowly change. So if it's, you know, I, we did this, some cases, calculations. In these three cases, and here it shows that we calculate energy barrier. Energy barrier turns out, classical nucleus is always have a high energy barrier. That's understandable because the you know, sharp edge has, and you depend on large energy. So excuse me, this, these graphs are experiments or are you solving this equation or what are we looking at? So what's your square? Well, what, am I, what am I looking at? Is that, a, is that an experimental result of something or is it? So this is based on experiment, all experiment results we find the curve, it's like this, it's a slowly change. The, 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 that's, what you find the that's what we find from experiment observation. Okay, and it's supposed to relate somehow to making this thing zero or minimizing it or doing something, right? Well, minimize, yeah, minimize, so what we did is minimize the energy, right? This one with that, we want to minimize the, the energy, free energy. This is a very common thing to do. I mean, it's, I like it. It's we, we actually discussed this before, right? This, so it, it turns out, when you, this is a question, any, any you know, gradient de decrease, the energy barrier is always lower than classical nuclear theory. Classical nuclear theory is also high energy because you have a sharp edge. I mean, you can see always extendable. So this actually makes sense. We think about it. that makes sense. Nature will not always choose low energy, right? We want a sharp edge always you no know, expensive. I hate to ask a stupid question, but are you trying to make this thing close to zero or what are you trying to do? The right hand side of this equation. The so right hand side, well you cannot make it a zero. You, so we're we trying to minimize. So we're trying to take a derivative, we try to minimize this energy, delta G. Okay. So you get an interesting equation. Yeah. So if you if you know substitute. Well, I, I worked on this with you. Yeah, we, we, we. You get curvature, that's one term. And that's when you take, great, and when you do the oil, when you take the derivative of this thing, uh -huh. instead of equal to zero, <coughs> you have essentially curvature, okay. one term, gamma times curvature. Uh -huh. uh, and then the other term is derivative of alpha, it's alpha prime, what the heck is that? I don't know, it's, it's uh, well, uh, alpha prime, alpha prime just you know, like this function. You can d d depend on this actually, this function is of course, we, we experimental measure, we have a gradient, but this gradient in nature is more complicated. So we, here we just use some. But the, but the other term you think it's gradient, when you take its derivative, you get the curvature of level sets. Of yeah, yeah, yeah. So so that's a later level set, because this is also in the level set. The level set exactly have this absolute value of this. Uh, well, this, this, yeah, this, when, you, when you minimize that, you get curvature motion. Mm. You know, 
uh, if you want to minimize a surface, yeah. the easiest way to minimize it is to move it by its curvature input, period. Okay? So that's what this should be leading you to. Wait. You don't want to minimize delta G here, right? No. Because its minimum as you just go infinitely far out in radius, right? You want to find the maximum point in delta G. That's the barrier, and that will give you the rate for nucleation. Oh, yeah, for, 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 for this, you for this point. You want the minimum of delta G. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's no. just as far out and Yeah, yeah that's right. I mean, we, we keep going now. But for, for you to take a derivative, we will find this point, the barrier. You want the minimum of the derivative of delta G. Right, 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 yeah, yeah. But but uh, Stan's talking about the dynamics. How, but uh, here's a static model. Okay, we, yeah. we you're talking about dynamic. How does it change a function of time? If you change a function of time, yeah. you're going to shrink this thing by its curvature. Yeah, but uh, and you're going to add another term, which is just essentially uh, the volume. Yeah, this, this is we have. I mean, we we were thinking about this. Is so much more challenging because if we. If you try to, if you know mathematics, so we were thinking how the dynamics that would be ideal. The nucleation, if you can understand the time. I worked on this before. Yeah, but, but the nature is more complicated, right? So it's sometimes, you know, you form ice, sometimes you don't form ice. So it's not a, you can simply just like, we, we were thinking, we discussed about this. Well, because, I'm, sure, I'm sure this model is oversimplified, but it's interesting. Yeah. So here we just, a static model. And uh, yeah, Paul, thank, thank you very much. We actually try to calculate the barrier. The barrier, the derivative we call the minimize. All fluctuations that take you up and over the barrier or back over the barrier, it's not just strictly minimizing or finding the, the zero of this function. Because in that case, the crystals either go to infinite size or size where they disappear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if, yeah if neither yeah. of those limits is interesting. Yeah. yeah. Is that okay? This is an interesting discussion, yeah. I mean, this is still, the dynamic will be clearly cool because that, that, but I'm sure we have to add a lot of bonding conditions because the nucleation is such important, and you know. Right, if you, if you, if you, if you, if you minimize, yeah, shrink to zero. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. Is it good, right? It's okay, so far so good. So, yeah, no, we also mathematically show that as long as the monotonic decrease all the parameter issues, as long as this alpha, our plants decrease. The energy, the OPG model always a low energy than the classical nuclear theory. Actually, that's actually can be mathematically shown. So that's you no know, our model compared is a two-step model, the classical nuclear theory. Actually, so you know, so we add atom or molecules, they form this kind of a small initial nu nuclei. They have a high order near the you know, the core. Low order parameter or either uh, structural order, the chemical orders, and then the order getting better, but the boundary always, you no, know, when close to the boundary, the order always worse, and eventually form you know, the larger kind of uh, the crystal or more ordered phase. So that's actually our model. Um, I have uh, you know, uh, another ten minutes. I talk about two D material. This is a hot topic nowadays. Now, 2D materials, it can be the metallic semiconducting and insulating. You know, it's, it's, it's a hard topic. So we've been working on this. And uh, you know, I think uh, Angus and, uh, and uh, Paul also showed this uh, you know, 2D materials. Defects play very important roles. Okay? So, but uh, we always want, I'm also into 3D. This is a 2D projection. You know? so, but we want to get a 3D. Um, so we got a data set, we do we two the different angles. And uh, so one thing we noticed then that when I put the 2D materials in the Holy carbon film as a whole, they actually vibrate like crazy, like a drum. And we find that at high angle, this atom becomes elongated. So we have to do deconvolution. We use a Lucy Lichardson method to do deconvolution. And atom should be spherical. So this becomes spherical. And then we did a no, developer they called a scanning AET. Turns out when the number of projections very, when the, the, the 2D material is very thin, we just very few number of projections can get the reconstructions. And then, now this uh, linear dopamine MOS2, this correspond. this is actually Molly and the sofa. You can see blo larger blob is larger Z, small blob is uh, no low Z, right? And uh, this use uh, conventional AET, SAT can get a better, um, no. SAT, we just do small region reconstruction, reconstruction and then uh, patch them together. And it turns out for tomography, it's very interesting. If, if you have a, a no, uh, for adult and a ch child, if you do the CT scan, okay? If you take the same projections, you, now if I ask you which one can get a better resolution, of course the child, because the child's body is smaller. 
It's a no projection. So the, the resolution should be related to the size. Uh, so, so in our case, because the 2D material is so thin, we, we can use a small reconstruction and patch them together, actually. This is, uh, that's our basic, very simple idea. And here shows, okay, I, okay, you don't see very clear, but it's three atomic layer, you can see. Um, the Molly and uh, Rini and Molly, you can see very, I mean, so far I can see a, a little far, low density, okay, you don't see much. But actually, trust me, you have to. And atoms are elongated because the, the missing wedge direction is very large. But we can trace the individual atom very, very accurately, okay? And you can see this is a region, uh, now there's actually missing atoms here, there's a missing atom here. Um, we can look at the point defects. And um, from this region, we trace the total number of atoms more than 2,100, the Morley of 686, so far more than 3, uh, 1,300, and uh, radian, 21 is black, and uh, pink is uh, so far vacancies. And then we did try to you know, um, quantify the, the, our precision. We, from our 3D atomic model, we use you know, exactly, you know, I think Peter mentioned, use similar method. We, we use uh, prismatic, actually. We have been, my students have developed pris prismatic, actually uh, use GPU version of the prisma, and it can be very fast. We can calculate the multi slide simulation, and this is calculated projection, and identical almost with experiment. And then from this, Calculate projection at a noise, so we can do the same thing. We can trace the individual atoms. So we have an atomic model from experiment measurement, atomic model from this calculated multi slice. And the range is 12 picometers, more than 4 picometers. Very, very accurate. And for 2D materials, because the very thin, so we can get a very, very accurate. So far, it's 15 picometers. And here shows a movie, and the gray corresponds perfectly MS, do people believe, but the color corresponds to our structures determined by man, there's a deviations, okay? Especially when there's a point defects. You now when there's a point defects, you see this black corresponds Rhenian open and the pink corresponds uh, vacancy. Especially along Z, uh, the deviations are quite large. Now this is actually, so this is called a 2D material, actually it's Z dimension. And there's a lot of it, uh, deviations. And you can see this a ripple, the 2D material actually look like this. This is all the atom of the Rini or Molly. You can see there's ripples. And we can also find uh, the, the, the bonding. Now, this is a good region when there's a point defect Rini. This is actually the replace the Molly with the Rini atoms. Differently, then there's some distortions. There's, vac there's point defects, uh, vacancies, and there's just bound distortion. We can quantify the bound angle, the bound distance because we have so many same type of defects. We can do quantitative analysis. And we can also kick in the strand uh, tensor. You know, here corresponds, to the, it just circle corresponds to leaning dopants. Whenever there's a leaning dopant, especially on the z-axis. So single atom you, in the crystal can create a CN tensor. It's just like, okay, if, a, if a people are sleeping regularly, I suddenly I pull one person out and then, you no, know, especially very tight. If you know, when you go back in the in the in the flight, right? Very, everybody very squeezed, the irregular. If we pull one person out, then other people will kind of a stretch, relaxed. So kind of created this kind of a um, strand map. Actually, this can be uh, we actually we can find we quantify the strand map due to that single point, defect, single atom, either defect or point or the linear dope. This is linear dope because it's. It's a high, high Z, larger atoms. And we can see, indeed, because of the difference of the reunion, and especially along the ZZ axis, the, the, the difference is larger. It's introduced by single dopant. Oh, this one, I, I, I think I made it. And somehow, I, I just repeated it somewhere. So it's just like, let me just, okay. And finally, we also did, a, um, you know, this atomic coordinate can be used for uh, DFT calculations. Now we did two things. One is directly from uh, the measurement for the DFT calculation, calculate the, 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 uh, the band gap. The, this is actually very important for uh, no, the applications. This is the indirect band gap because this points, it's no, very high. But when we relax it, DFT is always relaxed. So we talk about the global. That's DF density function theory, always use global minimum. They've relaxed, but relaxed, you know, the band structure is different. Which means the property is different. This again is a matter stable state. We measure room temperature. This is zero Kelvin. And 
We do the measurement and indeed confirm this is right. So this experimental coordinates is right. But this one relaxes, it's always global minimum. And in this, we have a dopants, and the dopants create more shadow bands. And if they relax, it's become also the dulux band gap and indulux band gap. So this shows, you know, the atomic, this, we are in a matter state, this is a matter stable state, and it, we can capture this matter state, matter stable state. So, okay, I, so much, so I hope I convinced you, you know, this AET, we have determined for three D atomic structure of crystal defects and disorder systems. I feel you now from 2D, 3D, and 4D, that, that's uh, really the, the future direction. You know? I, AI can really help. Uh, can, especially I'm really into the 4D, because when I took the sample, right, most of the atoms still the same uh, structurally, but some atoms change. So mathematically, there should be a way to entangle this. Uh, we have multiple projections, and whether some, some small fraction atom can be changing. So uh, this, is, this is a challenge for, no, uh, this uh, for the core participants. If you have the ideas, so I'm happy to discuss with you. Know, we can, this could be a very, very important in the future. Get a 40. I know there's some, uh, in the extra community, I know um, they're already doing something like this, but they get an individual atom, you know, atomic motion. <laughs> atomic movie, right? And, uh, sorry. and we observe atomic steps, 3D twin boundaries, and um, we you know, observe the dislocations. And we also uh, decipher the solid chemical order disorder at a single atom levels. And we you know, study the nucleation and uh, has been determined the individual atom, 2D materials, as high as four picometers. So this has you know, opened a new direction because we add a new dimension. And the new dimensions, right? X, Y, Z, and also hopefully time in the future. That's the way it should, should, should be going. And be quantitative. The reason the quantitative then data become immortal. You can put a data bank because the coordinates, and other people can use these coordinates for the other studies. The images, you publish even nature science, people cannot use the image for their research, right? So this is why I think everybody wants to be immortal, right? I mean, we can't, but your data can be immortal. That's pretty cool. <laughs> uh, so finally, I want to thank my collaborators. This is my group. I have some, some group members here, Saman and uh, um, I also you know collaborating with Stan's group and uh, Min and uh, Elisa. They are uh, very helpful in complete aspects. I've some, uh, Stan has been collaborating for many years. I really you know learned quite a bit from his perspective. He's still I'm admired. He's uh, just a few months ago at uh, 80 years birthday. He's still energetic. You know, <laughs> uh, stay with us. That's actually you know he love what he's doing. Um, you have wonderful collaborators, and also, you know, we put everything online. This is actually, I try to be as transparent as possible. All the data software online. So, if you want to you know, try this, all this information online. Okay, thank you for your time. Thank you.